Hi, my name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant, where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So if you're up for it, let's join the discussion. Hello, and thank you for joining me on another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Lynn Yap. Lynn is the founder of Active 8 Network, whose mission is to increase the participation of women in technology and entrepreneurship. She started her career as a corporate attorney, graduated from the Wharton School of Business with an MBA, working, and then went on to work in investment banking. Her curiosity led her to write a book about business as a force for good called The Altruistic Capitalist. This book culminates conversations with leaders at for-profit organizations, entrepreneurs, and investors alike for their personal experiences. Lynn, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show, David. Absolutely, thank you so much for your time. Let me start with, um, you know, a, a source of stress for myself and, and and I'm sure for many others, how has COVID, the uh, ongoing pandemic, impacted you and what you've seen in business? And then I want to get into my whole other list of questions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for asking. Um, I am very grateful uh, during the pandemic that um, the health of my family, myself, and my close uh, and my friends have not been impacted. We have all been safe from COVID, so that that is that is good. In terms of business, um, and this is how the altruistic capitalists uh, came to be. Actually, as part of Activate, Activate works with schools and. Our programs are in collaboration with companies. So when schools had to shut down, the activities of Activate had to pause temporarily as well. And I thought, what better way than to write about um, business as a force for good? Because at the start of the pandemic, I also saw that companies and were coming together, whether they were competitors or otherwise, they were working with governments, working with nonprofits in order to develop vaccines, provide the needed relief that um that that uh, for frontline workers and everyone else that that needed um that needed support um at the start of the pandemic and and even now so um so i i think the pandemic while it led to a lot of loss of lives and livelihood i think it also has some silver linings to it in that it brought us closer together um and we are starting to be more intentional about how we are in terms of where we invest our time, where we invest our money, our resources, and how we do business. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Let me backtrack a little bit and ask you about your your really interesting background. Um, what propelled you through law school, then Wharton, which that's not, either one is not easy. Um, and then investment banking to where you are now. What made you, what drove you to to go through those channels and then make the changes in direction that you did? As you were saying that, I'm reminded of uh, what one of my classmates from Wharton said to me. Lynn, why do you always have to do such difficult things? <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if I intentionally want to do difficult things. What drives me across the different um, careers that I've done and uh, projects I've been involved with is the opportunity to learn and to grow from each step. So I have moved from being a lawyer to going into law school, uh, sorry, for, from being a lawyer to going to business school and then working in investment banking because I, I love learning. I love um, tackling challenges and, and, and seeing where that takes me. I'm not committed to, all right, I need to have like 
uh, I need I need not be like a, a billionaire or I need to have that status or something like that. But what I'm committed to is is learning. And this is what the past year has been a, a big learning journey to becoming a published author. Yeah, well, congratulations on that. Were, when you just as an aside, when you began writing your book or, or had the idea for the book at first, did you go through any intimidation or any writer's block or anything like that? Because just from my own experience, I have a degree, I have a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm working on a novel and it's the most intimidating thing in the world. Of course, as as a writer, uh, the thing that, and I publish every week now, uh, I published one article today about mm -hmm. uh, the impact model and something that I developed based on my experience and conversations with other people, uh, with, with people working in the field. The impact uh, model. And the impact model, yeah. I, okay, I want to write that down and make sure I ask you about it. <laughs> yes, I, okay. I published that today. And every time I hit publish, I mean, this is just an imaginary publish button, but every time I do that, like, oh, I'm leaving myself exposed. I'm, I'm putting myself, I'm, uh, I, I'm putting myself naked in front of the world because so many things can happen. People can come and attack me, say I'm wrong. This yeah. is, I have, I have no, I, I have no reason to talk about this. Uh, open myself up for criticism and, and to be judged. And so it's very hard every time when I hit the publish button. Of course, when I did it for the book, that was like the big, like, oh my God, uh, this this is it. Because there are also personal stories in that book. And now it's open out there for, for the whole world. So yeah. there is um, the, the, the exposure that writing and publishing yes. um, th that challenges me. And uh, imposter syndrome as well that uh, was there when I first started writing. Like, who am I to... Who am I to to talk about this? Am I really an expert? Do I have any um, do I have any grounds for doing it? And it was it's thanks to um, my my support system, my network, and my community who says, "Yeah, you well, you know a lot about about this topic. You've been working on it for a few years, so of course you have um, you have grounds in which to write these." Um, uh, you have grounds in which to publish about it and it's backed up by research. It wasn't like I just wrote the book plucking out ideas from thin air. I did research and interviewed 50 people for, for the book. Yeah. 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 I think um, it's, it's, it's important to confront the imposter syndrome feelings. Um, now what, how much of the journey that you made from law school, Wharton, investment banking to where you are now, how much of that was intentional? How much of it was just, this is the area that I feel like going in at this time in my life? Um, and what were you looking for, I guess? That's the larger question. Because when I saw that in your profile, I thought, this is really interesting. Some there's something going on here beneath the surface. Is these aren't decisions you make, uh, you know, like what's for lunch? What you know? What drove these 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 uh, this evolution or these changes? Or is this just a crazy girl um, going up on her journey? Spinning well, it's possible, but it, I mean, honestly, if you were crazy, I don't think you would have made it through law school, and then Wharton, then investment banking. If you're crazy, you might have made it through one of those, but not all, you know, all of the above. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, well, I, I'm someone who loves learning. I love to challenge myself, and I love to grow. And I think um, uh, implicit in that question is also purpose. Um, I, I guess I, as I as I mature and as I learn, I understand a little bit more. I understand myself a little bit better. What is my purpose? What um, what is really important to me? And what drives me? What are my values? And that's uh, and and that grows and that sh uh, and that shifts as we gather experience, as we gather more knowledge, and we know more about ourselves. When I first started as a young adult, of course, I was. Um, a little bit influenced by what my parents told me, you know, first out of college, like, what do you do? Well, uh, I was always told, you know, be a lawyer. It's, it's a, it's a good job <laughs> and it is a good job. Right. So um, when you, so when you said first, 
first out of school, was it? Or first out of college? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, either way, either way, right? Like out of out of school, out of, when you graduate from high school, it's like then you're expected to go into college and know what you want to do. Yeah. And you're 18 at the time. How would you know what you want to do for the rest of your life? Well, you probably know, don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, you like, don't. How would you? I mean, you, you could be uh, very evolved uh, uh, intellectually, but then emotionally, it, it's highly unlikely you're going to be at an adult level at that age, intellectually and emotionally, and not even to speak of spiritually, if, if, if you believe in that. The odds of you having all of those ducks in a row at that age are very slim. I certainly wasn't. Right. Yeah. And that comes with, um, that comes with knowing your purpose, right? It takes time yeah. as you go through life to know what it is. And, and with a career, um, and we are going to live a very long time. We have the good fortune of having um, advanced uh, technical, uh, advanced healthcare knowledge and, and tools uh, and science that enable us to live a lot longer compared to previous generations, which means that we will be likely working a lot longer compared to previous generations. Like, I can't imagine doing the same thing over and over again for 60 years or something like that. If that's no. how long we're going to stretch our professional lives, uh, yeah. So in that sense, is we are con what the message is, is we're continually evolving and right. we have to continuously learn, develop our networks and uh, increase, increase our knowledge in the direction that we want to go to. And so purpose to a certain extent is evolving with us as we, as we go along. Yeah, when you said that about doing the same thing for 60 years, I mean, I remember there was a website and I, I'm just saying this because I, I saw their logo and the logo just really impacted me. There was a website, I don't even know if it's still up anymore, called Rat Race Rebellion. It's a great name. And I remember their logo was, it showed a, a banker, you know, wearing suspenders and his cup of coffee, his mug full of coffee. And he's harnessed to a chariot. And the person driving the chariot, you know, is cracking the whip and the, the person, you know, hitting him with the whip is just some kind of CEO. And the CEO is laughing and, you know, throwing hundred dollar bills at him and cracking the whip and saying, faster, faster, you, you, you know, you mule, you know, you, you donkey, go faster. And when you said that, doing the same thing for 60 years, it makes me think of that image. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that. I want to be like Voltaire said grow your own garden so knock on wood hopefully you know by the time i reach that age i'll have a garden like voltaire said which is basically being self-sufficient so you don't have to do what you don't want to do at that mm -hmm. age i would much rather oh anyway um let's go to active eight yes now you're the founder of active eight can you get into what active eight is what it does, how it works, who it serves, and why, because I thought that was very interesting as well. And then how does that tie into you as, as a human, as an entrepreneur, and you know, what you're doing? Lots of questions in there. I will try and get everything. It's at, it's at Russian tea again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, no, but uh, great, great questions, all of them. I just hope I capture everything. Oh, so, I, um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, you can. <laughs> Activate is a for-profit organization that works with companies to increase the inclusion of women in technology um, and, and digital careers. And what mm. that is, is it combines, um, it puts women together with 13 to 15 year old female students uh, to work together on projects usually related to sustainability. So whether that's healthcare or environmental uh, sustainability, for instance, these are just some of the examples, um, uh, to work together to uh, basically increase understanding and empathy between the generations, but it also um, as a collateral impact for the girls to see, hey, I can also be like this woman who is a role model to me, uh, who's working in technology and um, uh, or, or in a digital career. So that's um, that's what Activate is. Now, why it started, and this is when I first started to get more into my purpose, if, if you if you like. Sure. Uh, when, um, 
so I was working very much with uh, tech startups uh, in investment banking. I was working in equity capital markets, helping startups uh, raise public financing through IPOs. Tech stars, uh, maybe. It, yeah, a little bit, but also with with individual startups. So, um, I, I, I mean, we at that time we were even it was quite funny. Um, Facebook was considered a startup because it was still private when we were courting it and we were trying to get to be on its, uh, get to do its IPO. So we were chasing Facebook for a while um, to be one of the bankers to help it go public. And so, yeah, I, 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 I looked at companies like that. And every time I went to a tech event or a startup event, I would be one of the few, not just uh, from an um, ethnic perspective, uh, but also from a gender perspective, I would be one of the few women in, in the room. And that annoyed me a, a little bit. I, I wanted to, uh, while it, to a certain extent, I have then the power to bring the uh, alternative perspective in the room, but I also would prefer that there were more people like me in the conversation sure. so that the products that we build, the culture that we, that we have is more inclusive to, to people from all backgrounds and all um, from, from different backgrounds, essentially. And that led to activate network. My idea yeah. or my theory is that, well, if you think about it as a funnel, there are a few women working in technology. Maybe it's because there are not as many women going into technology fields in college. And then I was like, but wait, maybe it starts even earlier. We're not we're filtering ourselves out. Women are filtering ourselves out to go into science and technology in college because at a young age we were we have been told, oh, we need to be we are we need to be moms we need to have children Caregivers. Uh, we need to we need to we need to get married uh, and we should be doing this and we shouldn't be doing those kind of careers maybe these subtle messages that uh, have been passed on to us early on are stopping us from going into into these careers and that's why activate works with 13 to 15 year old girls so um, mm. at that age i think that the the girls are still fairly open to receiving different messages and 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 i think um impressionable age where if you uh have them work together with a woman maybe also from marginalized communities or minorities uh and who are now successful in the technology area they are they might also be inspired to think hey i can do that too because if i can see it i can be it it's easier to achieve and to work towards that if you have already the vision and idea of it in your head. Absolutely. And I think uh, the inclusion, the visibility uh, leads to the participants. They're feeling that they're going, they're more likely to feel heard, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go into a room and there's no one else who looks anything remotely like you and no one else is the same gender, then you're more likely a not to be heard and b not to feel heard. So I I know how from having worked for many different marketing agencies, I was always struck by the ageism, the very obvious racism, um, and also the um, uh, what's the word? The, the, not necessarily discrimination, but just a lack of diversity in gender. So but pre predominantly, almost every marketing agency I've ever worked for, interviewed at, worked through was 99% male, white male, um, you almost always in their 20s. So then I would walk in there and say, well, I could run the whole agency. And over time, there, there's that's not going to go over as well, you know, even if you keep it to yourself. But... Um, so that's really good. Let me just ask you out of curiosity, why for profit as opposed to nonprofit? I know as a corporate attorney, you gave that some considered review. I'm kind of curious on that because I would think as an NPO, there would be more opportunity for collaboration and partnerships, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you know, and we've covered this, I have a very traditional business background. I was a lawyer, I was a banker, so I understand how business should be structured and the, the foundations of running a company well, right? I understand, I understand 
the foundations of business. And I think capitalism in itself is not bad. Just like technology in itself is not bad. And you cannot stop technology from developing or for growing in a certain way. And it's uh and it and it's so just like technology, capitalism, it's how we use it. Right. What I like about yeah, and what I like about capitalism is that it 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 drives innovation because there's competition and we uh, the, the market tells you what it is looking for, what the demand is. And so there's per se capitalism as an idea, there's nothing wrong with it. I think what happened, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm sorry. I'm just enjoying our conversation, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, where do you think capitalism breaks down? Like what you were saying, capitalism in and of itself is not necessarily an evil thing. It's like the, people have the conception that money is a bad thing. It's not money that's bad. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. You can hoard money and not share. Or you could say, I'm just going to use enough to live comfortably and use the rest to help others in need or what have you. Um, where does it break down? Is it materialism, superficiality? How, you know, how, how did it get to that point? I have a suspicion that it started with uh, Milton Friedman saying the social responsibility of business is to increase profits. This was a uh, nineteen an article in the New York Times in nineteen seventy, and that kind of, and that just kind of um, everybody just 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 was focused on that, and it was a mantra that people say tell us and that we were told in business school, although now that's changing a little bit because um, the business roundtable has also changed, changed its tune from uh, shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy, to looking oh. at the different stakeholders and the interests in order to, which as a responsibility of businesses. Yeah. So I think that's shifting. The business context has shifted. I think the problem with that 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 quote or a viewpoint is, is there's no nuance to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, certainly yeah. if you have a business, then the goal is to increase profits. Of course, you want to survive. You want to uh, continue for the next generation. You want to support your family. You want your employees and your staff to to be able to earn a, a respectable living and not, you know, suffer. Uh, but yeah, that that viewpoint, greed is good, basically. That, I mean, there was a little more in Milton Friedman's essay um, in, from from 1970 that goes. I mean, not not that greed is good. That was the many people remember Milton Friedman for the title of that article, which is basically the social responsibility of business is to increase profits. But in his article, he goes to a little bit more of the argument as to um, as to why. Uh, to a certain extent, business should only, but business should think about how it is that it can focus on on financial benefit. And one of the arguments, just to go into a little bit of, I won't sure. go through the whole article, is that the people that we elect to run businesses may not necessarily have the knowledge or the skill sets in order to create a solution for climate change, for instance. They might be financial wizards, but in terms of thinking, uh, in terms of thinking about what is it that we need to do to create renewable energy or renewable materials, they are not the experts. So why should they be held accountable for that? And that was one of the arguments that he had in his article. But mm. but generally, uh, people have taken the business world has taken it like, all right, increase profits, and that's what Milton Friedman said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could. I, I mean, maybe one day I'll write something to dismantle that uh, or, ref, or refute it. Uh, now, when you wrote your book, The Altruistic Capitalist, what topics does it address? What do you think is the main onus of that book and who it would be for ideally? Who I'm going to tackle who is it for ideally. Now, um, my when I first wrote the book, I thought this is meant for business leaders because it takes shifting the culture, shifting the setting the setting the purpose and intention of the business um, that then follows that come then comes with the right strategy in order to change all of that. But 
lately I've been thinking, no, this book is actually for everyone. We are all consumers, we are investors in businesses, and we are employees and companies. So each of us have uh, the power to actually shift the culture, to shift um, the way that businesses um, work. An example from my previous role, I was working at Adidas in terms in the innovation side of the business related yes. to brand strategy. Uh, and what we did was we decided to work with companies that were or startups that were more sustainability focused that will then help us develop innovative products, cool products that will engage and delight and, 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 uh, uh, and delight the, the end customer. So there is a choice, even, even though I wasn't the CEO, not even sitting on the board, but I could look at, hey, this is something that would be, uh, that is important to me. And I think it's something that would be important for the consumer as well. There were research reports that, that the end consumer of Adidas is also interested in sustainability, but that informed then the, the projects that I worked on. Okay. What... What challenges do you see in capitalism today? Where do you think it's ultimately headed? Do you think capitalism as a whole, and you can address this, you know, just in North America if you want, or you could go at the whole concept globally if you want. Where do you see it headed? Do you think it's going to change? I'd like to get your, your, your viewpoint on that. Yeah, I, I can probably speak to North America and Europe um, better than other parts of the world. I haven't done as much research, and uh, the research as well for my for my book only came from people working in these regions. Um, now, the World Economic Forum proposed 21 different metrics in order to measure the impact of, of businesses. Europe has already standardized some of these metrics related to carbon emissions reporting or sustainability reporting, and that, um, that is not quite there yet in, in North America. Now with these um, stakeholder capitalism metrics that the World Economic Forum publish, they are working with international uh, accounting standards as well as regulatory bodies in order to standardize that. So when we as investors or uh, consumers want to understand how a company behaves or on what principles and and uh, what principles the the company operates on we can look at the these standardized reporting and understand that better and make choices as to who we work with who we buy from and who we invest in okay uh, when you refer to the altruistic capitalist mindset what is that? What does it achieve? What does that feel like? What advantages are there to having that? Mm -hmm. So the altruistic capitalist mindset that was developed through interviews and research with uh, executives who work in this space, as well as social entrepreneurs. If you like, it is like a roadmap of mindsets. Um, it starts off with mindfulness, then it goes into curiosity, then it goes into grit. Um, to a certain extent, if you if you like, mindfulness is understanding yourself, which also relates to um, having a better understanding of other people. And then curiosity is a little bit like the tool set that helps you develop solutions to to tackle global issues such as climate change and inequality. And collaboration through slash grit is about scaling that idea, scaling that solution, and bringing others along with you. So that's more or less the roadmap of, of the altruistic capitalist mindset. Now, would that parlay into what you call the impact model? Yes. Um, well, the, so the impact model, it is mainly looking at what are the business activities um, and what is the impact of the different business activities? So you may have certain activities that, um, it's easier if I perhaps uh, try and draw it out in the air. Sure. So if you think about four circles, the, the inner circle being the smallest, that is a level one impact. Okay, like a and Venn diagram, I think. Uh, not a Venn diagram, because Venn diagram, they're overlapping. Okay. And this is uh, just circles on 
that, that grow out of each other. Um, and so at the core, there are certain activities that, that companies do. Um, think about disaster relief or emergency um, situations, um, or, or even when a business, when a company collaborates with a nonprofit, that, that is, um, let's say that sometimes ad hoc, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't address um, symptoms, doesn't tackle um, causes, and it definitely doesn't make any systemic change. It is something that is necessary. When there is a hurricane, for instance, you step up and say, all right, here, here, this is the food that you need. This is the, the clothing and bedding that you need. I, I'm going to help you. So that, that, that's a short-term temporary relief. And you think about level two impact, now that is when you, and many CSR, many, many corporate social responsibility activities are related to this. Uh, you, could, you could partner then um, with, with nonprofits where you have volunteer services and you try and um, help, help affect change in that way. So that's level two. And then level three, that is when you start thinking about, okay, what are the causes of some of these problems? How can I address that? So for instance, you may, um, I'm going to use Adidas in as, as another, uh, as an example again. Uh, we then started to use recycled products, recycled materials into products to make, to make more innovation, to have more innovative products into the market. That is now tackling, um, tackling the, 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 the cause of the, tackling a cause related to climate change. So that's level three impact. Level four is thinking about, all right, what is the cultural shift? What is the ecosystem changes that we can make in order to scale the impact? That could look like partnering with multiple organizations, working with public bodies um, to develop policies, to develop uh, programs in order to actually make big, big changes. One example is um, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative. And that helps to provide funding for women entrepreneurs in emerging economies. Mm. Now, when you give financial independence to, um, to a woman, she is able then to feed her family, to help her community. The, the community is, you know, is able to get more education. It stabilizes the entire community. So that actually tackles multiple issues at the same time. It's not, it's not just about... Um, uh, equality within the community it's um, economic growth it is um, talking about healthcare because when when you are better educated you have better healthcare you have better education generally uh, rising tide lifts all boats kind of situation right so and that's you, level four impact yeah when you take a multi-level approach like that you're more likely to achieve at least one or two of your overall long-term uh, goals that way as well. Let me ask you, how do you define mindfulness in business? And how is that different from mindfulness in daily and personal life? You know, is that embracing Taoism, which, you know, I'm getting back to that? Is it logotherapy, which, is, you know, Victor Frankl wrote about in Man's Search for Meaning? Uh, how do you define it? Now, I'm not an expert on philosophy. I personally practice um, mindfulness through meditation. Okay, that's great. Yeah. I'm a meditation <laughs> junkie. I do it, you know, at, at least two, three times a day. I love meditations on mm -hmm. YouTube and mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? John Kabat Zinn, the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm sorry, didn't, didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, not at all. It, this, okay. is, this is a conversation, so I'm happy to happy to hear as well how how you how you approach it. Um, I actually uh, am a vipassana meditator. I'm not sure if you're you know of you know of that. We go on ten day silent retreats once a year. Well, not, I, not during COVID. I've not done that for. Yeah, uh, I've been on I've been on a retreat a retreat for like a year and a half. I think my wife would probably call it being grouchy for a couple of days. <laughs> I, I actually um, I I love those ten day retreats. Not to say that they're easy because they're really difficult to go through, but there's so much energy and creativity for me after the retreat after the ten days. 
Yeah. Now, what was the term you used? Vin... Vipassana. Vipassana. I've heard of yeah. that. It actually sounds similar to writer's retreats. I'm, I'm not sure because I've not been on a writer's retreat, but this is complete silence for 10 days. All your devices are removed uh, from you. You surrender your uh, phones, your laptops, no writing, no writing materials, nothing. Uh, and the other thing is there's no eye contact. So you shouldn't be communicating with anyone either. You're just entirely on your own for 10 days. So it's a very difficult journey because you go into uh, different places in the 10 days. Right. A lot of people um, probably don't do well with that or are very, very social and, and can't handle that. Um, sounds great to me. It is. Um, I, I, that like sounds I said, great. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to yeah, go like, right now. Yeah, like I said, it is. Um, it, it, it for me gives me a lot of energy, and I feel very excited and happy and hopeful and optimistic. And the other thing is a lot of love for the world. I, I just feel like, oh, I want to help so many people. That's what I. That's how I usually feel at the end of the ten days. Yeah, that's great, and it's. <laughs> probably you know your natural predisposition coming to the fore and not you know feeling uh perhaps you know more influenced by the exterior society maybe so for you mindfulness is going on these retreats and and getting in touch with yourself a little bit more and having just some peace and quiet that is one meditation is one. I mean, so um, during this retreats, it's like 10 hours of meditation a day. Oh, yeah. But I also I also journal. Uh, I think being present and being intentional. And this is um, how I practice it in the past year during the pandemic as well. Being more conscious as to what um, what I put into my body in terms of what I eat, what I drink. So I was experimenting a lot at the start of the pandemic. I'm trying to be vegan, cutting out alcohol. So um, being very intentional about what I, I put into my body, what I was reading, what news I was reading, um, what, what, what books I was uh, consuming. So mindfulness for me is, is all of that, being intentional and being present with um, the people around you. Yeah. I mean, so much of that is self-awareness, I think what are you doing and why are you doing it and toward what ends and not mm. um, kind of just responding? Um, what I choose to say is not reacting. Yeah, the, that's exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to bring to, to refer back to the book that you mentioned, Victor Frankl, um, to increase the, to increase the space between the event and the response, the, Longer yeah. that you can, the longer that you can um, have that gap, the more likely you respond rather than react to what is what is happening, what is triggering you. Absolutely. Instead of reading the comment on social media and saying, "Well, I'm going to let that person know exactly how I feel," <laughs> stop for a minute and just think: A, does a person really need to know how you feel? Is stating how you feel going to help them? Will it do any good? Right. So, you know, just as, as, as one example, you know, really thinking before re reacting. Now, how can we cultivate that increased mindfulness across the board through what approaches or practices? And then I guess part two of that would be how can that inform you know what businesses do from over, overall planning to specific strategies, if that's a fair question. Oh, yes, completely fair. Okay. And I cover some of this in uh, the altruistic practice. That's what I figured. That's why I thought it'd be a good question. <laughs> yes, with some examples from companies that I, I, I interviewed. So they range from as simple, and Eileen Fisher, before they start, their meetings, they have a one minute silence, which I really like. I think it's a, it's so great. Um, at the end of the minute, they, they ring the bell thing and you know, you can basically come to the meeting, uh, being present because in that meeting you are 
with yourself. There's no phones and you just have space to breathe for one minute. So many of us, we go, we have back-to-back -back meetings. We're rushing from one to another without even, sometimes we don't even know like, who am I meeting? What am I doing at this, at this yeah. point in time? Yeah, it's very yeah. true. And that, and that one minute gives you that space to just, okay, breathe and come together. And then, and then we can start. So not just, um, uh, and, and, and knowing what is it that you want from that meeting and what you can offer the other person. Yeah, totally, totally true. And you'll, you'll probably remember bef even before our interview today, when I, uh, saw your name, I said, please wait a minute before we began talking pre-interview so I could get up, go have my tea, come back, get all my papers and what have you. But that's something that, yeah, uh, maybe not everybody needs it, but I think most people probably do need it, whether they acknowledge it or not. Uh, you know, it used to really grind my nerves uh, working for agencies where we would have meetings and the people would be unprepared or or even more grinding would be to meet with clients and then the clients are not prepared or the client is late or they don't have the information you need so yeah to to look at that and say well wait a minute i'm the creator of the problem so i need to train them in what's appropriate to work with me whether i work with a company or as an individual consultant but yeah, so much of that is slowing DF down and really valuing yourself, I think, and, and what you can bring to the proverbial table. Now, could we apply that? Well, I guess we could. I, it sounds like I'm answering the question to applying that to branding, marketing and other business of, approaches. Yes, I, I believe so. Um, what mindfulness is, it's knowing yourself but the other thing is being present to others and that leads to empathy and um, if you are familiar with design thinking you, you need empathy in order to design better products yeah. for for your customers and yeah. you have better products you have higher engagement you have increased brand equity you are listening my mindfulness is also about listening to the other person and so i definitely believe that mindfulness can lead to uh, better brand engagement, higher brand engagement. Yeah, definitely. Now, can cultivating mindfulness, do you think, negate or perhaps balance societal issues such as narcissism in business, which I've seen several articles from psychologists who have said that this is on the rise. Um, you see many articles about people becoming more violent on airplanes because they've been cooped up for so long now that now they're on a plane. How dare you ask me to wear a mask and keep my hands to myself? So can mindfulness, do you feel negate or perhaps balance some of the rise in narcissism, the materialism, uh, maybe the lack of planning for new business owners? But just in, in some of these types of incidents. So in reference to the example that you gave up. Just, yeah, people, it's crazy. Three people are going, in, are going crazy in airplanes. Yeah. I, I think what mindfulness um, does is also being present and, and having uh, better mental health, reducing anxiety, something as simple as a breathing exercise can reduce some of that. And that might help um, just bringing down that, that, that. <laughs> That anxiety, that that anger. Yeah, that, uh, maybe it's a low that, blood sugar. You just, just described. Yeah. In terms yeah. of planning, I think. Well, I I mentioned that I, I journal and that reflection that is also about mindfulness can help with being more longer term. Um, can help with more longer term thinking uh, rather than just um. You know, uh, materialism is very much about in the now um what looks good now what looks what is trending but if you are more mindful and you're more reflective you consider then what is more what is important in the longer term so i think that can also balance the other aspect which you mentioned which is um 
thinking, uh, thinking more into the future. Now, when you journal without getting specific, obviously, mm -hmm. do you journal in terms of this is where I'm at today? Mm -hmm. Or do you journal as so far as um, here are things I want to do, here's where I'm at, or is it some combination of those maybe? I do have a combination of this reflection of, and journaling practice has evolved over, over the years as well. I always have a gratitude section of what am I grateful for and to be very present with, with that rather than I'm grateful for my family. I'm not really thinking about it, but to really, as I'm writing it, to be very, uh, to actually feel it. And there's a sense of abundance that comes with practicing gratitude. Absolutely. So yeah, you realize what you have and that so many others don't and won't. Mm -hmm. And when you realize how much you have, you also think, you are also, well, I see this opportunity. I see that opportunity. I can see so many different ways in which I can help others. So that, so it flows, gratitude flows, comes abundance and then comes opportunity and creativity. Mm. That's how I see gratitude. Yeah, I've, I've never really been good at, at journaling. And you would think that I would be as somebody, you know, with, with a degree in English and everything. But I always equated it more with writing per se. I remember I was recently reading Isabel Allende, uh, the Latin American uh, author. S almost, I would, yeah, and maybe she would disagree, but it looked like everything that she's ever written is journaling in a, in a way. I mean, obviously the names and, and uh, the people and situations are slightly changed, but so much of it is just vi so visceral, you know. Yeah. I remember... Yeah, I'm, I was just going to say, I remember Hemingway saying that you should write about what you know and what you've experienced in your life. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, though. No, so I was going to add to that. It's exactly what I was going to connect it with when I spoke earlier about a challenge of being a writer. That's why we, it feels so exposed and I feel so naked when I publish because there's a part of me that goes into each piece of writing. Good writing, I, I believe good writing, Good writing needs an element of yourself in it to be authentic. Yes. You can't write a fake, not a fake story, but you can't pretend to be someone else and write something that doesn't work and it doesn't resonate with, with the audience. This is my belief. Yeah. And I think also as the writer, it would be difficult to be motivated and feel excited because it's not taking from you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a form of self-expression. Right. And the more authentic it is, the better. I, I started working on a novel and I realized that it was more of a chore. And mm -hmm. I kept thinking, this sucks. Let's go back to the drawing board. The protagonist needs to be me. Let's say 50 to 70 percent me. And then I thought that's still not good enough. I need to bring in a childhood friend change him around, let him be a different character, then have an ex, let her be a character. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, make her evil, of course. And then, <laughs> you know, throw in some action. I got to have some action, you know, and then, you know, put it in the future so I can talk about society. And, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, now it's a little bit more interesting, right? Yeah. So, so this novel coming out? I have, to, I have the outline about 80% done. And I have a title for it. So I just have to take a couple of days and to sit down and begin. So once I begin, I like to get things done in like 90 days. Nice. It's, wow. That's, that's just me oh, having worked right. for marketing agencies. When I used to work at marketing agencies, they would tell you everything needs to be done. You know, you would have monthly you know, quarter, you know, you quarterly, monthly, you know, you have deadlines for everything. So I always look, if you're going to do it, do it quickly, you know, just get it done. Then you can go back and do version number two. Right. So yeah, I remember reading Voltaire wrote Candide, I think over the course of several days, 
he just told everybody leave me alone and he sat down in his study and was the you know grouchy you know sardonic voltaire so yeah i would want to get it done quickly cuz i think also the longer that something goes on the greater the chance that you could lose that momentum mm -hmm. so i would want to get it done quickly i feel it building you know within me i feel like you know this is 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 it a good place now thank you for asking though um what changes do you see in embracing mindfulness and purpose driven conduct both personally and professionally for business owners in terms of you know their short term goals or long term goals world view and behavior so if i may reframe the question how sure. does, how can mindfulness support long term thinking and yeah and do you see it being different than it was perhaps 10 years ago. Hmm. So I believe that mindfulness is more acceptable now uh, and it may take different forms. For instance, um, at, at Google, um, there was an engineer called Chad Main Tan and he started uh, basically a mindfulness training program at Google years ago, but he didn't label it mindfulness or meditation, he labeled it as emotional intelligence because that seemed more measurable to the engineers that he was targeting to. Right. Uh, so, but I'm seeing a, a shift um, and a couple of people that I interviewed for my book as well, they uh, just label it mindfulness, even a company such as Siemens, which you would, you would uh, assume that, well, it's very traditional, it's German, it's engineering, that they would not be open to anything like mindfulness. But uh, the, 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 the coach that I spoke to, the trainer, she said it, it, took, um, it took off when she, when she taught them that uh, the participants express how more, um, so there's focus, there's alertness, there's creativity that comes out, not just from, um, not, not, you know, that comes out from mindfulness and meditation. Uh, I mean, of course, there is the reduced anxiety levels and all of that. But what they also experienced were, were these creativity, um, uh, uh, creativity, uh, it was creativity that, that came out of that training program. So yeah, I'd see that there's a shift in the acceptance of mindfulness in the business context. Yeah, I've seen several studies that have stated that in organizations where there were more similar practices that employee retention had increased, that turnover had decre decreased, um, and that employees reported feeling more positive about going to work. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing, a mindful organization has a tendency to also be more purpose-driven because you um, are you're more aware and intentional about the things that you do. So you tend to be, you tend to know your purpose, you know what values drive you, and therefore you head towards a particular North Star, a particular direction that resonates with your purpose. And to that extent, you are more um, long-term thinking. You take a longer-term perspective on your business activities. Well, let me ask you, I've only got about two or three more questions, so I hope we're good for time. Um, yes. How do you, and I don't know if this is the right word, so how do you train someone in mindfulness as an entrepreneur? Perhaps a better word would be to explain to them or acclimate them to it as a practice, not just the concept, because a concept without doing is pretty pointless. I think that's even from the Tao Te Ching, I'm not sure. But how do you get them to understand it and then actually do it? I think it really depends on the person and what drives them. Oh, as with most things, illustrate why it's beneficial and how it could help them. And then just come up with, share, share, share some tips in which they can actually practice it in small doses in their life. And hopefully, once they experience the benefits, that will take on. You can't force anyone to do anything. You can just um, share with them how it's how it's why it's beneficial and how they could possibly incorporate it in their daily lives. Yeah. 
Um, let me ask you, what closing thoughts would you have to summarize your personal and professional journey for others that they could learn by your example? Uh, so I, I believe that um, you, we all need to know ourselves, what's important to us, what values drives us, what, what is our purpose essentially. And that will guide us to be more intentional about what we do, who we interact with, uh, and just to be present with in every moment as much as possible, to be present all the time. Yeah, yeah. Identify what that means for you mm -hmm. and, and, and begin doing it. Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. Lynn, I, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time and for our conversation. If people would like to learn more about the services you provide or the book, how can they best learn more or reach out to you? People can reach out to me uh, by going to altruisticcapitalist.com. Uh, there is a sign up to um, sign up for my newsletter where you can get uh, things such as the impact model uh, to learn more about how businesses can be a force for good. And there's also my email contact there on the website. That sounds great. Well, thank you again for your time. And for those of you uh, tuning in, thank you for your time. If you've enjoyed this conversation, uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe and share it with others and hope to see you in our next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to like it, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you'd like to learn more about some of the subjects discussed in this podcast, go to www.dms.blue. And if you'd like to find out where this podcast is carried on your favorite provider, go to dms.blue slash podcast. And if you'd like to apply to be a guest, book me for your own podcast, or just submit a question, go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for your time and hope to meet you in our next episode.